Now, we got another client. This is a case study of success. They have, they're also in the safety critical systems business. They have really good requirements, and the requirements are documented in a machine readable way. And my associates and I were working with them, and we realized, hey, uh, this is this is great. You get testable requirements, well integrated with your FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, which is how medical systems are regulated in the United States. They have requirements for traceability between their tests and the results and the requirements. So they didn't have any problems with that. But here's the unexpected benefit. We found out, oh, requirements are machine readable. So we created, designed and created this test tool that could go through and based on reading the requirements, the tool reading the requirements, it could automatically traverse through the screens and verify that the right things were happening and verify that there weren't liability problems, the screens were correct, and then, oh, by the way, they could figure out how to make it do localization testing for them, too. They could check that the screens had been properly localized for the dozens of different languages. The benefits have just kept coming and coming and coming. If you're curious about this, the, there's this article called Quality Goes Bananas, and don't blame me for the title that was picked by the editor of Software Testing Performance Magazine. But it describes how this tool works. Now, the great thing about this tool is it was built in about four weeks, total tool budget of zero. Downloaded free stuff off the internet. Okay. So, who would have thought, right? You had good machine readable requirements and all of a sudden you were able to have all sorts of reliability and localization and screen flow testing for free. Four weeks of work. Okay, so another lesson. Don't wait to the end. Don't wait to the end to get serious about quality risks. This just happens over and over again. But there are a lot of times when it's very clear during requirements of design that you have risks to the quality of the system. Bad things that could happen that can make your system not satisfy your customers, users, and other stakeholders. It's a quality risk. It could be performance related, it could be requirement or reliability related, it could be functional. But many times these things are clear early on in the project. It's clear oftentimes during design. Hey, guess what? You've got complex interfaces. Things that could go wrong here. Now, do we want to wait? Well, we probably don't, but many times we do. And this is too bad because you can use models of various kinds, simulations, for example, to identify and remove quality risk during the design period rather than waiting. You can do component integration and system testing rather than just waiting. Oh, all the bugs out at the end. A lot of times we've seen with clients that you get into situations where you've got this big tsunami of bugs coming at you at the end, you can't fix that. You can't undo the design problems that were introduced earlier at that point. So, example, bad example, failed project. Um, this is really sad because this didn't have to happen. This is a two-year-long project. In the beginning of that project, one of the senior members of the technical staff built a, a simple spreadsheet, Excel spreadsheet, that predicted various kinds of performance problems that would happen with the, the software running on this large, complex server. Uh, it was His predictions were amazing. Resource saturation at exactly the point where he said, they had this spreadsheet, he showed it around to people, and they said, oh yeah, that's bad, we should probably deal with that, and then they didn't. Okay. Design, implementation, component testing, no follow-up on this. Nobody checking to see, if, are we having the problems that were predicted in that spreadsheet? We get into integration test, system test, big problems, big server performance problems. So, he said, oh, Start patching. <laughs> Let's start patching problems. So, here's the performance on the first run of the performance test. You see, this is the response time. That's the desired upper 
bound, and this is the uh, legal supported loads, and the response time should have been no more than that at this level of load. But you can see, uh, kind of a problem here, there's the, there's the bottleneck happening, right? And then, oh, okay, well, let's, let's patch it. Let's throw some hardware at it. Let's do some software fixes, okay? Yeah. It's a little better, but guess what? There's the next bottleneck. Oh, let's patch that. Let's throw some more hardware at it. Nope, there's the next bottleneck. We have an expression for this in the United States called peeling the onion. You know, instead of slicing right through the onion, you're going through one layer at a time. And uh, what are you doing if you're peeling an onion? Crying, right? Yes, you're crying. There was a lot of crying, a lot of wailing and gnashing of teeth, um, and ultimately the uh, project failed because of these performance problems. Okay. Again, these were predicted 18 months in advance of us seeing them in test. Somebody showed us a spreadsheet. These are the things you've got to watch out for. Now, how sad is that? work on a project where you knew what could have happened and you just people didn't follow up on it right and it's not one I can't point at one person yeah, that's the bad person we all dropped it and we all should have been on top of this stuff we're talking about a two-year project that had about a hundred people on it we're talking 200 person uh, years of effort lost wasted that's sad. Okay, so what could this project have looked like? Well, we saw another example of it, a subsequent project. Again, we have a spreadsheet doing modeling of the resource utilization. And guess what? Instead of ignoring it, design changes were made based on predicted problems until the spreadsheet said, okay, this will work. We're looking good. Then they created a simulation using a tool that's currently called Hyperformix. Some of you might have heard of it. And they were able to run simulations. Found more problems with the design. Fine-tuned the design some more. Notice that at this point, there isn't even any hardware or software. It's just a design. Okay. As they started to create the uh, hardware and software, there was performance testing at the unit subsystem level, and that was Compared against the simulation, problems were found in the simulation, problems were found in the implementation, those were fixed. Okay, so once we got into system test, for the most part, the simulation and what we saw and what we wanted to see were, were matched. Okay, let me show you an example. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, so, simulation. The simulation for the IMAP server, which is the email server, predicted 45% server utilization of 25,000 users. Okay, that's the prediction of the simulation. We got two servers here with load balancing, simulated load of 25,000 users. Look at that. 45% and 41%. 100% minus 59, 100% minus 55. That's pretty good, huh? So we simulated it, we built it, we iteratively refined the simulation based on what was seen as it was being built, and then when we tested it, we found a few problems, but nothing shows up, nothing fatal to the project. If you want some more details on how we did this, if you go out to the bcs-us.com basic library page is an article called The Right Stuff out there that describes how this process worked. What does this require? Again, discipline. I'm not talking about anything that we can't do. We know how to do this. And we've known that we should do this for a long time. A lot of these concepts stretch all the way back to Fred Brooks, The Mythical Man Month. The difference between this project and the project I was just talking about, the failed project, discipline. Doing what we already, as an industry, know that we should do. 
Okay, a lesson here. Stuff needs to work together, right? Stuff needs to work together. And that's just going to get more and more true, isn't it? Everything is connected to everything else. I mean, who? I can do phone, uh, web-based banking on my phone now. I can go out, uh, this thing runs Safari. I can access my bank account. So what do we got? We got software running on an iPhone, talking to COBOL on a mainframe. And I can guarantee you that when the guys are writing that software on the mainframe wrote it, somebody said, yeah, you know, someday, about 30 years from now, somebody's going to have this phone, and it's going to have an internet browser on it, and he's going to be using it to transfer money. And those people would have looked at that person and said, where did you come from? Mars? What's the internet? Handheld phone? <laughs> right? So everything has to talk to everything else. So this is a challenge for us because just because things work by themselves doesn't mean that they're going to work together. And just because older versions of things work doesn't mean that newer versions of things will work together. And quality risks can compound. You can have a small problem in one component that once it gets down to the other components that it's talking to, that is magnified as a big problem. So, we gotta test control flows and data flows across interfaces. We gotta make sure that stuff works together. We gotta use continuous integration to make sure that when we break builds or we break interfaces, we found it quick. Now, some people associate continuous integration with agile and iterative. No. This is an idea that's been out there for a long time, but again, it's just it's discipline doing it. Automated unit testing frameworks. Let's use these. And not just for component testing, let's use them for integration testing. Let's not wait until the end to find integration problems. Okay, so famous example of not thinking about excuse me, I'm not, sure why I did that. not thinking about um, integration in an Arian 5 rocket. Right? Some of you know this story. Uh, basically, there was a reuse of a piece of software from a previous version, the Arian 4, and there was an issue with 64-bit floating point versus 16-bit integer, and that was uh, an attempt to share data between two software components, incompatible data types. And so one piece of software got confused. And what happened? Some of you have seen this video, if not, you can go out and take Basically, the rocket goes up and it starts to tip over because of the miscommunication between these two pieces of software. And at one point, you can see it, it's almost completely sideways, and then they hit the self destruct button on this thing. And then we're talking about $500 million blown up. Oops. You know, how hard would that have been? How hard would it have been to run that integration test? Not very hard. Certainly wouldn't have cost five hundred million dollars. And you know, keep in mind this was this was actually a, a best case outcome. Once they hit the launch button, the best thing that could have happened was five hundred million dollars exploded in there. Super expensive fireworks. And the worst thing that could have happened is they could have failed to destruct it, and it could have come down and killed some number of people. Now, fortunately, we're talking about French Guiana, where the, you know, it was launched. So there's limits on how much damage it can be done, but still, there could have been people killed. 